Hi there, I'm Miss DePoy, and today I'm going to start reading to you a book called The Egypt Game. It is by Zilpha Keatley Snyder. It's one of my favorites. I enjoy reading this with my students every year, and so I hope you enjoy it. In this first chapter called The Discovery of Egypt, we will learn the exposition. And if you remember, the exposition is the setting of the story, kind of get an introduction to the characters and things. This is realistic fiction. So again, I hope you enjoy The Egypt Game. Chapter One, The Discovery of Egypt. Not long ago in a large university town in California on a street called Orchard Avenue, a strange old man ran a dusty, shabby store. Above the dirty show windows, a faded peeling sign said, A to Z, antiques, curios, used merchandise. Nobody knew for sure what the A to Z meant. Perhaps it referred to the fact that all sorts of strange things, everything from A to Z, were sold in the store. Or perhaps it had something to do with the owner's name. However, no one seemed to know for sure what his name actually was. It was all part of a mysterious uncertainty about even the smallest item of public information about the old man. Nobody seemed certain, for instance, just why he was known as the professor. The neighborhood surrounding the professor's store was made up of inexpensive apartment houses, little family-owned shops, and small aging homes. The people of the area, many of whom had some connection with the university, could trace their ancestors to every continent and just about every country in the world. There were dozens of children in the neighborhood, boys and girls of every size and style and color, some of whom could speak more than one language when they wanted to. But in their schools and on the streets, they all seemed to speak the same language and have a number of things in common. And one of the things they had in common at that time was a vague and mysterious fear of the old man called the professor. Just what was so dangerous about the professor was uncertain, like everything else about him, but his appearance undoubtedly had something to do with the rumors. He was tall and bent, and his thin beard straggled up his cheeks like dry moss on gray, root, gray rocks. His eyes were dark and expressionless and set so deep under heavy brows that from a distance they looked like dark, empty holes. And from a distance was the only way that most children of Orchard Avenue cared to see them. The professor lived somewhere at the back of this dingy store, and when he came out to stand in the sun in his doorway, smaller children would cross the street if they had to walk by. Now and then, older and braver boys, inspired by the old man's strangeness, would dare each other into an attempt to tease or torment him, but not for long. Their absolute failure to get any sort of reaction from their victim was not only discouraging, it was weird enough to spoil the fun for even the bravest of bullies. Since there were several antique stores in the area to draw buyers, the professor seemed to do a fairly good business with out-of-town collectors, but his local trade was very small. It was said that he sold items that were used, but not antique, very cheaply. But even for grown-ups, the prospect of a bargain was not enough to offset the discomfort of the old man's stony stare. It was one day early in a recent September that the professor happened to be the only witness to the very beginning of the Egypt game. He had been looking for something in a seldom used storeroom at the back of his shop when a slight noise drew him to a window. He lifted a gunny sack curtain, rubbed a peephole in the thick coating of dirt, and peered through. Outside that particular window was a small storage yard surrounded by a high board fence. It had been years since the professor had made any use of the area, and the weed-grown yard and open lean-to shed were empty except for a few pieces of forgotten junk. But as the old man peered through his dirty window, two girls were pulling a much smaller boy through a hole in the fence. The professor had seen both of the girls before. They were about the same age and size, perhaps 11 or 12 years old. The one who was tugging at the little boy's leg was thin and palely blonde, and her hair was arranged in a straggly pile on the top of her head. Her high cheekbones and short nose were faintly spattered with freckles, and there was a strange droopy look to her eyes. The old man recalled that she had been in his store not long before, and along with some other improbable information, she had disclosed that her name was April. The other girl, who had the little boy by the shoulders, was African American, as was the little boy himself. A similarity in their pert features and slender, arching eyebrows indicated that they were probably brother and sister. The professor had seen them pass his store many times and knew that they were residents of the neighborhood. The fence that surrounded the storage yard was high and strong and topped with strands of barbed wire, but one thin plank had come loose so that it was possible to swing it to one side. Both the girls were very slender and they'd apparently squeezed through without much trouble, 
but the boy was causing a problem. He was only about four years old, but he was sturdily built. Moreover, he was clutching a large stuffed toy to his chest with both arms. He paid not the slightest attention to the demands of the two girls that he, turn loose of that thing for just a minute, can't you? And let me hold security for you just till you get through, Marshall. Marshall remained very calm and patient, but his grip on his toy didn't relax for a second. When the little boy in his huge plush octopus at last popped free into the yard, the girls turned to inspect their discovery. Their eyes flew over the broken bird bath, the crumbling statue of Diana the Huntress, and the stack of fancy wooden porch pillars and came to rest on something in the lean-to shack. It was a cracked and chipped plaster reproduction of the famous bust of Nefertiti. The two girls stared at it for a long, breathless moment, and then they turned and looked at each other. They didn't say a word, but with widening eyes and small, taut mouths, they sent a charge of excitement dancing between them like a crackle of electricity. The customer, an antique dealer from San Francisco, was stirring restlessly in the main room of the store. Hearing him, the professor was reminded of his errand. He replaced the sacking curtain and left the storeroom. It was more than an hour later that he remembered the children and returned to the peephole in the dirty window. There had been some changes made in the storage yard. Some of the ornate old porch pillars had been propped up around the lean-to, so they seemed to be supporting its sagging tin roof. The statue of Diana had been moved into position near this improvised temple, and in the place of honor at the back of the center of the shed, the bust of Nefertiti was enthroned in the broken birdbath. The little boy was playing quietly with his octopus on the floor of the shed, and the two girls were busily pulling the tall, dry weeds that choked the yard and stacking them in a pile near the fence. Look, Melanie, the girl named April said. She displayed a neat, prickly bouquet of thistle blossoms. Neat, Melanie nodded enthusiastically. Lotus blossoms? April considered her uninviting bouquet with new appreciation. Yeah, she agreed, lotus blossoms. Melanie had another inspiration. She stood up, dumping her lap full of weeds and reached for the blossoms, gingerly because of their prickles. Holding them at arm's length, she announced dramatically, the sacred flower of Egypt. Then she paced with dignity the bird bath and with a curtsy presented them to Nefertiti. April had followed, watching approvingly, but now she suddenly objected. No, like this, she said. Taking the thistle flower, she dropped to her knees and bent low before the bird bath. Then she crawled backward out of the lean-to. Neat, Melanie said, and taking the flowers back, she repeated the ritual, adding another refinement by tapping her forehead to the floor three times. April gave her stamp of approval to this latest innovation by trying it out herself, doing the forehead taps very slowly and dramatically. Then the two girls went back to their weed pulling, leaving the thistles before the altar of Nefertiti. A few moments later, the blonde girl sat back suddenly on her heels and clapped a hand to her right eye. When she took it away, the professor, peering through his spy hole, noticed that the eye had lost its strange, droopy appearance. Melanie, April said, they're gone. I've lost my eyelashes. At about that point, a customer entering the professor's store forced him to leave his vantage point at the dirty window. So he missed the frantic search that followed. He also missed the indignant scolding when the girls discovered that April's false eyelashes had fallen before the altar of Nefertiti, where Marshall had found them and quietly beautified one of the button eyes of his octopus. When the professor was finally free to return to his people, the children had gone home, leaving the storage yard almost free from weeds and a thistle blossom offering before the birdbath.